Those joining us online, we're glad to have you with us this morning. I will begin with the call to worship. Let us begin this day by rejoicing. The Lord has done such wonderful things for us. Let us be glad. The day before us is uncertain. We know not what we will encounter on our way. Where we go, we go forth as people of the living God, and we go forth to touch the lives of all with his healing touch. Let us begin this day with rejoicing and return to our homes with gladness. At this time, the announcements will be up on the screen. Monday, August the 19th at 11 is the commodity distribution. Tuesdays at 9 a.m., the bazaar crafting here at the church. Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. is prayer time. Monday, August the 26th at 6.30 in some men's groups. Wednesday, August the 28th at 7 is women's Bible study. Are there any other announcements? Yes, Sandra. At 5 o'clock is the open house at the new daycares, and everyone is welcome. Any other announcements? Okay. We will stand and sing our opening songs. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter its courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Wow, it's great to see everybody today. I got a confession to make. Oh, doggone it. So last night, my wife and I, we drive to Kansas City and we go to see a Christian concert. And it was truly amazing. It was three hours of people standing, raising their hands, praying, singing. Uh, it was just, it was unbelievable. Um, but, yeah, so here comes the other part. A 60-year-old is never, ever supposed to see 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> I know this, okay? I believe, I, I, it might be in the Constitution, I don't know, <laughs> but it's real, and so, so Wayne, you better bring it this morning, brother, <laughs> so otherwise, otherwise, we're going to have to have people poking me to get, get woke up, so, uh, so my confession is, I'm exhausted, but I'm so thrilled to be here with you guys today. You are good, you are good, when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You guys sound great today. You are peace, you are peace, when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, 
You're the reason that I sing. You are life. You are life. In you, death has lost its sting. And no, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reign. You are more, you are more than my words will ever say. You are Lord, you are Lord. All creation will proclaim. You are here, you are here. In your presence I'm made whole. You are God, you are God. Of all this I'm letting go. And no, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever reign my heart will sing no other name jesus jesus my heart will sing no other name jesus jesus my heart will sing no other name jesus jesus my heart will sing no other name jesus So I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough, nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world forever reign, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever reign dear god as we put you first in everything we do and everything we say as we truly take on the life of a christian being christ-like Help us to have the courage to do so, to be able to shine our light, to be able to walk step by step with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated if you like. <clears throat> oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways. And step by step, you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. I will follow you all of my days and I will follow you all of my days and step by step you lead me and I will follow you all of my days oh God you are my God and I will ever praise you, oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you.
God, as a deer pants for water, may we pant for you. May we have a hunger for you, a desire to know you, to love you, and to serve you. May we want your character to be our character. May we want your model to be that which we follow. May we live up to that name for which we are called Christian because of Jesus Christ. Today, as your word is proclaimed, Lord, help us to have open hearts and receptive minds and willing hands to do what you've called us to do. And now, Father, we pray as your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now our children may go to Children's Church. And while we're sorting all that out, uh, Jamie, I thought you was going to be talking about the fact it was three hours long. And I'm listening to this deal the other day where uh, somebody is in China and they've asked him to speak. It's at a church, it's an underground church, from 8 to 7. I can tell you all I know and a whole lot less time than that. <laughs> Have you ever seen a top ranked team? get beat by a team that's not ranked at all. <clears throat> it's often the day when the better team loses. The ranked team thinks they have it in the bag. They're sure they're going to win. They're overconfident. They do not take the other team seriously. That's what happens when you're overconfident. So I looked up in the, on the internet to learn something about in, uh, uh, overconfident. And it said overconfident bias is a cognitive bias that causes people to overestimate their knowledge and abilities in a given area. It can impact decision making and make it difficult to be cautious. And then they give us some examples of being overconfident. And if you've been to college, I bet you're guilty of this one. College students overestimating how quickly they can finish their term papers. Doctors overestimating the accuracy of their diagnosis. Gamblers assuming they can accurately predict what will appear next on the roulette wheel. Lawyers predicting they can resolve a case in a shorter time than actual takes actually takes they really don't care though because they get paid by the hour students believing that they have the top grade in the class when they're actually in the bottom half drivers failing their driving test because they're sure they're a great driver and in, did not practice parallel parking now the proverb writer deals with this same issue of being overconfident. It says in Proverbs 16, 1, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Haughtiness goes before destruction, humility precedes honor. And that can be a serious problem spiritually as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul says, and, and the ESV puts it the way I learned it, basically in the King James. Therefore, if anyone thinks he stand, take heed lest he fall. The New Living puts it like this. If you think you're standing, be careful not to fall. Have you been there? In other words, have you, are you overconfident? Have you been conceited? If you are, you're in trouble. Have you been there? If you haven't, would you please stand? We'll give you a round of applause, okay? Today, we're going to look at Peter, who learned the hard way the truth of this reality. We've been going through encounters with Jesus and this month we've been looking at Jesus' encounters with Peter. And today we're looking at what I would say is not Peter's most glorious day. It's a day in Peter's life that went down in infamy. It's a day I'm sure he regretted the rest of his life. 
It was that sense of shame that clung to him like white cat hairs cling to black slacks. This event is so significant, it's recorded for us in all four Gospels. In other words, if you make a mistake, everybody's going to talk about it, right? So after the Last Supper, before they get to the Mount of Olives where Jesus prays and soldiers come, in Matthew 26, and Jesus told them, This very night you all will fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, Even if they all fall away on account of you, I never will. I, truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, This very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Now Mark and Luke mention the fact that the rooster is going to crow twice. And you're going to deny me three times. I kind of like the way that King James puts it. Something like this. Before the cock crows twice, you're going to deny me thrice. I like that word. In verse 20, 35, Peter declared, Even if I have to die for you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. I mean, Peter says, I'm never going to fail you. And the rest of the disciples jump on this Me Too bandwagon. And Luke records Peter saying, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. You remember how Jesus leaves the Last Supper, goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He prays. Hardly before he's done, Judas comes and betrays him. And Jesus is led away to be tried in that illegal kangaroo court. But it's in the garden that Judas comes with soldiers and it's there Peter's ready to defend his Lord against all odds. John 18 says, Then Simon Peter, who had the sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The high priest's servant's name was Malchus. Now Matthew and Luke tell the story, but they don't mention the name of the apostle or the name of the person whose ear he cut off. But John does. Of course, John writes a lot later than the others. Maybe the statute of limitations hadn't run out yet. Actually, I really think it's because in mentioning Peter's name, they might have been putting Peter at risk. I think Peter was surprised at Jesus' response in his attempt to protect his Savior. Jesus commanded Peter, put away your sword. Shall I not drink of the cup the Father's given me? In other words, this is all part of God's plan. Remember there were several times that Jesus tried to explain to his disciples that he must, he must be betrayed and, and tried and, and crucified and be raised again on the third day. But it never seemed to quite sink in. It just didn't seem to fit their dreams for a Messiah. Now just hours before that actual event of Peter denying Jesus, Peter assured Jesus that he would never, never disown him. He would never, never deny him. He would die first. He'd go to prison first. Never, never, not me, Lord. The others might, but not me. And Peter proved his courage with the sword against all odds. I think he was aiming to the head, and the guy just moved his head, and he got the ear. But uh, then in verse 57, those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, now, sometimes this can be confusing because Caiaphas was a high priest at this time, but sometimes it refers to Annas as the high priest. Now, Annas had been the high priest, and they're supposed to be a high priest for life, but the Romans had taken over, so they bought and sold that office, and uh, Annas had been high priest. He had four sons that had been high priest, and now Caiaphas, his son-in-law, was the high priest. Where the teachers and the elders of the law had assembled, um, in other words, the Sanhedrin was there, but Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courthouse, a courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the, guards, with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and all, the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they could not find any. Though many false witnesses came forward. Uh, could we have the next slide back there? We're a couple behind here. Let's go to the next one. One more. Finally, two came forward and declared, This man said, I'm able, able to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. 
Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is the testimony of these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell me if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But from now on, all of you, but I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One coming in the clouds of the heavens. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, You have spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now we have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He's worthy of death, they answered. And notice verse 67. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? Now Peter's watching all of this. Peter's confused. I mean, he's seen Jesus' great power in the past. He knows he could call down ten legions of angels. And what about now? Is this the end of his Messiah, his rabbi? Will three years of ministry and training and fellowship go down the drain? Is this the end of the beginning? I like the way Ken Geyer puts it. The hour is late. The night, dark and chilly. Peter has followed Jesus all the way to the courtyard where the Savior, under heavy guard, awaits his hearing. He comes because Jesus is his Lord, because Jesus would have come for him if the tables had been turned. He comes to help not knowing what he can do or how or when. A thousand scenarios crowd his mind. He's confused and torn. Do I grab a, for a sword and fight? No, he rebuked me for that in the garden. Do I testify on his behalf? A lot of good that would do. Do I watch and listen so I can rally the disciples tomorrow? Now I'm confident that a lot of conflicting thoughts pass through Peter's mind. But I'm sure he found the scene that was unfolding him before him to be very disconcerting. Notice verse 69. Now Peter was sitting in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before all of them. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went to the gateway, where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with, the Je with Jesus of, Nazarene, of Nazareth. And again, he, he denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. For a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely, you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. After, <clears throat> and then he began to call down curses. And he swore, I don't know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you'll disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Peter had followed that crowd of soldiers as they come to arrest Jesus. He had noted where Jesus was taken and joined that motley collection of people who were hanging around the courtyard as the proceedings were going on in the house of the high priest. But Peter's strong northern accent from Galilee gave him away in those Jerusalem circles. It invited a comment of suspicion that you're one of the followers of this Galilean. Oh, by the way, a Galilean accent was so disliked by those in Jerusalem, the rabbis. The rabbis forbid a Galilean to even pronounce a blessing in the synagogue. So this was a very painful and shameful story. Early that very morning, Peter had sworn he would never disown Jesus. Death could not drag denial out of him, and yet he was denying that he was a disciple, that he even knows Jesus. Clothed in anonymity, Peter comes by himself to warm at the campfire, along with Jesus' captors. He comes to think and to sort things out, to plan his next move. He sits, he pushes his palm against the heat and rubs his arms and his hands and he takes from the fire its warmth and the idle companionship of strangers who are small talking the evening away. Talk around the fire crackles 
with the news of the Nazarene's arrest. They point to Jesus as they talk and nod and lay odds on his chances. The flames of the fire flicker upward in the flash, of, it flash into the night air. And little by the light of these flames, Satan will do his work. The servant girl squints at Peter through the uncertain light of the fire. Peter, that rock of Gibraltar. Among the disciples tonight would be a rock that would crumble. Tonight, he'd be reduced to a mere pebble. He would start the evening with a result, posture, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, even to prison to death. Even if I'll fall away, I will never fall away. Later that night, he would singly, handedly fight against a mob of soldiers, wielding his sword in the torchlit uh, Garden of Gethsemane. But before daylight, he would not be able to stand the stares of a young servant girl. How do you account for such great defection of such a dedicated disciple? Three times he fulfills Jesus' prediction that, that, that he would disown him. First he denies him and says, I, 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 I'm not with Jesus. The second time he denies even knowing him. And the third time he curses and swears that he doesn't know him. I wonder if he remembers the words of Jesus when he says, if anyone denies me before men, I will deny him before my Father in heaven. I think by repudiating Jesus, Peter hopes to escape unscathed. Now in Peter's defense, I think you have to say that Peter had a great deal of courage. I mean, he tried to defend his master in the garden, drawing his sword to fight against all odds. I mean, Peter had reckless courage, not only in the garden, but the last place you'd expect Peter to be would be in the courtyard of the high priest's house, and yet that's where he went. I mean, the other disciples had fled. They didn't go. Peter followed Jesus at a distance, but the soldiers were too close for him to follow closely. Peter loved Jesus dearly. That was never in doubt. I mean, he thought he could face any, any situation that might arise. Peter recognized his failure and immediately repented. Why did Peter fail? Well, maybe we ought to ask ourselves, why do we fail? Well, I think one reason is the fact that he was overconfident. Another word for overconfident is the word pride. In other words, he had inflated value of himself and his abilities. I can handle this. And he tried to handle it by himself. Another reason is he did, not, uh, he did not believe or take seriously the warning of Jesus. Tonight you will deny me. No, not me. A uh, third reason is the fact that he's on enemy turf. I mean, he's surrounded by the enemies. Number four, it's, it's late. It's late at night. He's tired. When we're tired, we're more vulnerable. vulnerable. And, and there was fear. The enemy's all around. He sees what's being happened to Jesus. I mean, Peter's torn between two feelings. In his heart, there is fear that, that made him want to run away. But in his heart, there's love that kept him there. I think the fail failure of the disciples was fear, but I think it was much more than simply their personal safety. I think there was that inability for them to grasp that Jesus was suffering and why he was suffering. And the final reason, one I think we're all guilty of, is failure to pray. You remember the Garden of Gethsemane? Jesus took his disciples to the garden from the, from the, after they'd finished the Last Supper. and He leaves the group here, but he takes his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. He says, you wait here while I pray. And he goes a little bit further to pray. And Jesus comes back. And they're asleep. He goes again and he comes back. They're not praying. They're not awake. Again, Ken Guy writes, Peter is a smaller man now. He, he's broken. He's exposed. Be hard on him if you like. Talk about how self-confident he was. Talk about how impulsive he was. Talk about how he's always shooting off his mouth and how he needed a good sifting, a good testing. Go ahead. But before you do, remember that the other disciples had already deserted Jesus. Peter and John alone followed him in that terrifying night. True, Peter followed him at a distance, but he still followed. Yes, he was rash in drawing his sword in the garden. He did it mistakenly. 
He did it against insurmountable odds, almost certain loss of his own life. It's true he failed Jesus, but he failed in a courtyard where the others did not dare to set foot. He failed under, not under normal pressure, but under the heavy testing of Satan. Go ahead, he says. Be hard on Peter. But remember, Satan was trying to sift him. But Jesus was praying for him. And I would say, go ahead and be hard on Peter, if you wish. But look at your own life before you talk. Maybe this ought to be our prayer. Help me not to pass judgment on Peter, Lord. Rather may his great and fervent love for you pass judgment on me. Help me as I deny you in so many areas of my life, in so many ways, and at so many different times during the day. When I'm too busy to pray, I deny you are the center of my life. When I neglect your word, I deny your competence to be the guide of my life. When I worry, I deny that you are the Lord of my circumstances. When I turn my head from the hungry and the homeless, I deny that you are a God of mercy who put me here to be your hands and your feet. When I steal something from another person to enrich, to enrich or enhance my life, whether it be material, something material or credit that is rightly due to another, which I have claimed for myself, I deny that you are the source of all blessings. Forgive me, Jesus, for all the quiet ways known only to you that I have denied you. I think that ought to be our prayer. And I think the question is how, how do we guard against temptation? I think the first thing you have to do is don't put yourself in the way of temptation. The Bible says flee temptation. I mean if your problem is if your problem is alcoholism stay out of the bar. If your problem is pornography put a child protector on your on your computer. But stay out of temptation. Don't go where you're going to be tempted. Secondly, repent. Repent before the wayward becomes willful. When Peter heard that cock crow and he saw that look from Jesus, he realized what he'd done. And he suddenly became aware of his failure and he went out and he wept bitterly. He repented of what he had done. You see, the longer we let sin continue in our life the harder it is to get rid of it the harder it is to let go the greater the grasp it has on us that's why addictions are so hard to break once they get started they get stronger and stronger as time goes on and thirdly remember the sin wounds oh it, it wounds ourself it wounds others but most of all it wounds the heart of the Savior how can I do this to the Savior I love? Remember, Jesus is praying for you. He's in heaven making intercession for us. Remember, Jesus did not pray that Peter would not be sifted, that Peter would not be tried, but rather he prayed that Peter would not fail. He's not praying that you would not face the difficulties of life. He's praying that you would be successful in overcoming them. When you fail, it's not if you fail, we all fail. But when you fail, Jesus will wash you if you will repent. Don't let sin define you. Don't let sin condemn you. Don't let sin destroy you. Remember that even when you are faithless, Jesus is faithful. Peter's tears meant that he truly loved Jesus. And the tears were a sign of his genuine repentance and his genuine remorse. Jesus told Peter, when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. Now the Gospel of Mark was the first Gospel to be written. Yes, Mark wrote it, but uh, <laughs> Mark! Mark is writing down for us what he's heard repeated over and over again from Peter. Literally, Mark is Peter's story of Jesus. Peter tells this story. 
It doesn't paint Peter in a very good light, but still Peter tells the story of his own failure. I think Peter is saying, that's what I did. And this amazing Jesus never stopped loving me. He forgave me when I failed, even in the bitterest hour of his need. He took me, Peter the coward, even me. And that's what Jesus can do for you too. William Barclay, his commentary, which by the way was written about 70 years ago. And so this illustration may be an old one, but it it's, makes a good point. There was an evangelist named Barlow North. He was a man of God, but in his youth he had lived a wild life. And one Sunday he was to preach in Aberdeen, and before he entered the pulpit, a letter was handed to him. And the writer of the letter recounted a shameful incident in the life of Mr. North. A time when he, before he became a Christian, stated that uh, if North dared to preach, he would rise in church and publicly declare what North had done. Marlowe North took the letter into the pulpit with him. And he read the congregation. And he told them it was perfectly true. He told them how Christ, how he'd come to know Christ, how Christ had forgiven him, and how Christ had helped him to overcome his own weakness, and how Christ had helped him put his past behind him, and how in Christ he's a new creation. And he used his own sin and his own shame as a magnet to draw men and women to Christ. And I think that's what Peter did. I think Peter's telling us, I hurt him. I let him down. At the most difficult and vulnerable time in his life, I failed him. And still he loved me. And he loved me, he forgave me. And he can do this for you too. Our Father, it's so easy for us to proudly state how good we are and how strong we are, how we will never fail you. But Father, we've all failed. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all need your grace. We need your forgiveness. We need to come back to you. And find hope that only you can give us. And we're so grateful for what Christ has done for us. For it's his name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand as we sing? We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks. Seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob, oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, seeks your face, oh God of Jacob. Oh, give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Be seated at this time.
Good morning. Communion is not a message about what we need to do, but what has been done for us. It's not a message about our ability to solve our problems, but God's ability and kindness to solve them. The gospel then frees us from carrying the weight of the world and the weight of our spiritual walk on our shoulders because God is taking care of us, providing for us, and at work for us. Rest in him today. Be still before the Lord by resting in Christ. Any burden, sin, trial, or weight you carry today, cast it on the Lord in prayer. Feel the bread between your fingers as a physical reminder that helps you say to God, as real as this bread is in my hand, so was your provision in Christ. And so I know I can trust you today with this thing. Take it. Carry it. Help me rest by resting in you. Please join me in prayer. O oh God, we ask you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread and wine to the souls of all those who receive them, that they may eat and drink in remembrance of the body and blood of your Son, and witness to you, O oh God, that they are willing to take upon them the name of your Son, and always remember him, and keep the commandments which he's given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing with Jamie, Good, Good Father, as we're released in rows to come up front to partake in communion, and everyone is welcome. As you leave the sanctuary, please drop your offering and blessing quarters in the trays by the doors back. Please join us in Fellowship Hall after the service. And thanks again for coming, and it's so nice to see all the new faces in the congregation today. We hope that you will come back. Oh, wow.